Ryan, let's talk about deep water nymphing for steelhead and trout. What type of water do you look for on really high flows when the entire river might look all the same? Yeah, so when you look at high water, I think a lot of us get overwhelmed by the thought of like, oh my gosh, that is a lot of water coming through the river right now. And you just see this big slug of water and it kind of intimidates everyone. We had a season in California where we had extended high water for like three months and we'd had clients show up and they're looking at the river and they're looking at 25,000 cubic feet flowing down the river and they're all standing at the edge kind of with their mouths open and you walk up to them and the first question they're asked is are we going to catch anything <laughs> you know and you know as a guide you have to reassure them yes I would not have you here if we weren't going to catch anything I'm not here just to take your money so understanding that high water doesn't mean that's unfishable. You just have to understand what steelhead and trout do when the water gets to high level. And really, it, it's kind of the way I tell people it's imagining, like imagining a storm, you know, if you're camping, right? Like if you're out in the wilderness and you're not in your warm, cozy house and a big storm comes through, you're seeking shelter, right? Like if you have a huge rainstorm or hailstorm and you're in a tent and you have a car next door, what are you going to do? You're going to get out of your car, out of your tent for the night and hop in your car and sleep in your car. So trout and steelhead are doing the same thing. You know, when the water gets high, they're getting pushed out of their comfort zones, right? They're getting pushed out of their tents and they're moving to the nearest structure or nearest slow water they can find. So that way they can survive. And what you have to remember when flows get really high, that trout and steelhead aren't technically looking to feed. They're really just looking for somewhere to survive and be comfortable. So what a trout and steelhead is going to do in those situations is they're going to find the nearest log. They're going to find the nearest bush or rock bank or places that generally don't have current in them. Generally, when the water hot when water is high, they have these nice small little current seams and all those fish are just going to push into those big slow lakes. So deep water nymphing, if you're fishing really high flows, uh, it doesn't mean it's unfishable. It just means you have to adjust your tactic. Let's back up and talk about this 25,000 CFS. How wide is the river that you're talking about? The river is as wide as a football field. Anybody who knows anything about sports, it's probably 100 yards wide. So at 25,000 CFS, the middle of the river is cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, and the middle of the river is probably 12 to 14 feet deep. So not super deep, deep. you know, not 20 feet in most. I'm sure it's 20 feet somewhere. Yeah, they're like like most rivers, there's variation. I mean, there are spots in the river that's 40 feet deep. But, you know, across the board, you know, at normal flows, our river is flowing at like six to eight feet when it's high like that. You know, it's such a wide river. You're not adding a lot of depth. You're just adding more breadth of water. When it's flowing at 25,000 like that, you're probably talking 12, 14 feet deep max. And we're talking about, are you talking about the Sacramento? Sacramento River, yeah. The Feather River gets high as well. The Yuba River, all, all of those are tributaries to the Sacramento River. So generally, if the one of the rivers is high, all of them are going to be high just because of, you know, we got a bunch of rainwater coming through. Are you fishing below a dam there on the Sacramento? Yeah, most of the California rivers um, are all going to be tailwaters. So the Sacramento River is the big one. The Feather and Yuba Rivers are tributaries to the Sacramento, and all three of those are, are tailwaters. I want to talk specifically on the next question about nymphs, deep water for steelhead and trout. But before we do that, let's go ahead and kick this show off. From high atop the world headquarters of Southeastern Fly, this is the Southeastern Fly podcast. Thanks for joining us for this episode. Feel free to share the podcast with your friends and fishing partners. Subscribe or follow so you'll be the first to know when a sh uh, episode drops. If you find value in the hot podcast, drop by the Southeastern Fly store and explore the merch that fuels this podcast. Sales of the mer merch is important, and so that's what keeps episodes coming to you. So who is our guest today? As you can tell, we're talking about the Sacramento River in California, so we're not necessarily in the Southeast. A couple of years ago, I traveled out to California for some R&R &R and went across the Sacramento River. Uh, our guest and I just had a pretty good conversation about the, all of the different waters out there uh, and the places where I may, may have crossed the Sacramento. But our, our guest today is the founder of Cast Hope. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization that positively impacts kids from California to North Carolina through guide-mentor relationships. You can find out more about Cast Hope at www.casthope.org. Our guest wrote a book, uh, which I saw on Instagram. 
I saw a uh, advertisement for it and I was looking for something to read. So I went ahead and ordered it. It's called A Real Job. Real is spelled R-E-E-L. There's a series of short stories and thoughts from the river. So I'm, I basically made it through the first short story. And I thought, this dude knows how to write. I contacted Ryan and just uh, went ahead and tried to talk to it, talked him into coming on the podcast. Uh, he's got it in Wyoming and Montana and California. He hosts trips to various locations throughout the West and soon to be in Mexico from our earlier discussion. He currently resides in Montana. Please welcome to the podcast, Ryan Johnston. Ryan, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me, David. I really appreciate being here. You and I have had a couple of different conversations. So one before I, I just got back from Colorado. So it was before I left for there. You were on your, you were in California on your way back to Montana. And we decided we were going to go ahead and make this podcast this week since we would both kind of be landing at home for for a short time. We had good conversation about many different things. Obviously the book, which I told you then, I'll tell you this now, it's a good book, dude. It's got good stories in it, lots of truth in there, (laughs) a whole lot of truth in some of them, (laughs) and a lot of funny stuff going on. You can't go wrong. And I put put some... uh, I'll put a link in there. I think I got it on Amazon. I'll put a link in there on how how somebody listening to this podcast can can get a hold of the book. And here's what we do, Ryan. We're all about the Southeast. A lot of folks are coming here to get information about the Southeast. So I want to provide information that pertains to the Southeast. And one of the things that happens here is we get big rain events, especially in the spring. Early winter, all the way through spring, sometimes we'll get a huge rain event in the summer here in Middle Tennessee as well, and they'll run big generators, and big generation, lots of lots of CFS and that sort of thing. And I wanted to tie in our conversation into some of the things that you've seen in California, guiding out there for, you've been guiding for 20 plus years, I think, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I started when I was 20 and I'm now 40, so that's 20 years of guiding. You are just a young pup. Believe me, I wanted to be able to, I wanted to take some experience there and try to tie it back into what may be happening here. And as we talked earlier, it doesn't matter if you fish from a boat, if you wade, however you decide to fish. It it doesn't really matter how you decide you're going to fish or how you, what your uh, experience can be, how you might be able to fish, either from a, from wading or from a boat or however it is that you might, you might end up fishing. You're going to be able to get something out of this. Just like you just talked about the water, you know, the, the big, the vastness of water. What are you looking for? Well, what you were talking about was let's look for something that essentially slows the water down, gives me some cover. And as a fish allows me not to drown. That's kind of the way that I like to put it. Uh, They're not interested in sitting out a lot of times and a lot of CFS coming at them. You're going to be able to get, if you're listening out there, you're going to be able to get something out of this, even though Ryan fishes on the, the left side of the country. Still, there's going to be some good information here. And the reason why I know that is because we've kind of talked through some of this already. He's been guiding for 20 years for stripers, trout, and steelhead. I want to specifically talk about trout and steelhead in deep water with nymphs. Uh, and I think probably the best place to start with that, Ryan, is what is your setup for deep water nymphing? And we'll talk about rods and leaders and weight strategies and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, if we're, if we're talking deep water nymphing, the, the special high flows, those are circumstances, you know, that, you know, you have to adjust for. But we're just talking deep water nymphing in general. You know, let's assume five to ten feet of water. If you're fishing in five to ten feet of water, generally you're going to have to fish a little bit larger rod just because of the length of your leader you're going to have to fish. In time, I think a lot of us know that you kind of have to choose your rod based on what you're fishing for. I mean, if, if you're fishing the Caney Ford and, you know, you're throwing a smaller rod than you were if you were down in Jurassic Lake in Argentina, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're not going to go deep water nymph in Jurassic Lake with a five weight. So it, it's the same It's the same thing. So you kind of have to pick that rod, not only based on how deep your water you're fishing and the length of leader you're going to throw, but also what you're fishing for. So in California, we have a lot of variation of steelhead. We have some rivers where our steelhead average two to five pounds. And then we have other rivers where they average eight to 12 pounds. So we can still deep water nymph for both of those. We can still fish really long leaders, but you don't need to throw an eight weight rod for a three pound fish. It's overkill. It takes the, the joy away from fighting the fish. Right. So a lot of the rods we're fishing here in California, it depends on what size of fish, what size of trout, what size of steelhead we're fishing for. 
but generally for deep water nymphing, you know, we're going to be running rods uh, six to eight weights, or some people like going longer. You know, those 10 foot five weights can work really, really well as well. Let's stop right there. Let's talk about the 10 foot five weights. Uh, Cause I've been doing a little bit of fishing with longer rod. What do you think the advantages are to those? And then we're going to come back to lines and leaders and that sort of thing. There, there's there been a trend um, for several years now. People are going longer on their rods. There's pluses and minuses to both. Uh, and the guide community, we've kind of gone away from them. Uh, there was a while there five or six years ago where everybody wanted a 10 foot rod. Uh, I think for people who do a lot of wading, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, that 10 foot rod enables you to roll cast easier. It enables you to hold more line off the water. If you need a high stick a run, it helps you with mending. The 10 foot rod in a, in, if you're fishing out of the bo- boat isn't a huge advantage. So you're seeing a lot of the boat guides actually going back to nine foot rods or nine and a half foot rods because that longer rod when you're in a boat is actually harder to land fish. You know, it, you know so when you start lifting on that fish, that rod is longer and softer. It's harder to get that fish to come up. So the advantages of that 10 foot rod while you're waiting, I think is huge and I'm a big advocate of it. But those 10 foot rods, if you're fishing out of boats, um, I'm not a big fan. I think the biggest advantage I see out of either waiting or fishing from a boat is you're going to lift so much more line off the water to mend after that. I don't know that it makes a ton of difference either way. Yeah. But that's an advantage in my mind. You know, it, it is for guys who like fishing softer rods for bigger, larger size fish. It is way rather than fishing a six weight, you can throw a 10 foot five weight. And it has more feel to it. So if you're the kind of angler that like, I just get the joy out of fighting fish. And if, if it's a little cumbersome with mending or a little cumbersome with casting, I'm willing to give that up. Yeah. Uh, I have several clients who love their 10 foot five weights. I watch them catch six and seven pound fish on them all the time. Yeah. It takes them a little longer, you know, um, but they still, they have enough backbone being that long that they can do the job in fighting the bigger fish. But for people who wade a lot, you know, I think there's a lot of advantages just in terms of, you know, if you have to high stick and keep more line off the water, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And when you're fighting a bigger fish with that longer rod, you got to kind of fight it off the butt a little more to, you know, as much as you can to, uh, to get it to the net. After that, you know, once you get it to the net, then it's a matter of, does it, do I have enough leverage and backbone to actually pick it up to get it, you know, into the net or slide it into the net? So that's, it does kind of, it really does take, in that case, a little bit more seasoned, I'll say, angler that can finesse it in there and maybe get the head pointed in the right direction and pull up at exactly the right time and get to slide in the net. But there's a lot of, a lot of advantages to them. But I, like you say, I don't know that it's, I don't know if there's enough fishing out of a boat other than the extra men to me that it makes it, makes me want to really go out there and, start trying to talk people into using it. I think probably a nine foot, we use a lot of nine foot six weights uh, around here. So I, you know, I think sometimes I think I question myself, am I just kind of stuck in a rut or is this the best rod? Uh, I'm not sure I found the best rod yet, but I, I tell people there is no best rod. Yeah. You know, I tell <laughs> it's really what your preference is. And I can tell you, from guiding thousands of days, a uh, 10 foot rod in a boat is not ideal. Uh, a nine or nine and a half foot rod is better. But if you like fighting a fish longer and feeling more of that fish, and that's your that's your thing you enjoy, then why not do it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I always teach my my friends and clients that you know fly fishing is not about perfection. We're supposed to be out there having fun, <laughs> you know. And and yes, our rods are our tools, and there are some rods that are better tools than others, you know. And you know, you can't bring a hammer to a gunfight, you know, um, yep. but in situations like this, when we're talking about just deep water nymphing, whether you're fishing a 10 foot five weight or a nine foot seven weight, like whatever you have available to you financially or whatever your preference is, just fish it, you know, go have a good time. I really like that because I think that sometimes folks get caught up in, I have to have the best this and the best that. And you pretty much, honestly, all the rods pretty much that, that have a, you know, a, a, a little bit better name on them. They don't have to be the biggest, best name, but I think they're all going to outcast, outfish what we can really do a lot of times. Well, the, the reality of it is, I mean, if you take a 25-year outlook on fly rods, you take 
the low end rods, whatever brand you want to attach to that. You take the low end brand from now, 10 years ago, they would have been the best rod ever made. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The technology of rods across the board is so incredible that no matter what your budget is, yes, there are, there are brand names, just like there's brand names of clothes or purses or whatever you're into. Like it, you don't have to have a thousand dollar rod to be a good angler. No, you don't. I fished with a two hundred dollar rod out in uh, out in Colorado, only because it had the right fly on it, versus my my eight hundred dollar rod. And I was like, you know what? I don't even want to just give me that rod and let me fish it. You know, and we just the two of us just swapped the rod because of the fly. That's the only reason we swapped the rod is because I was too lazy to dig through my pack and find another fly. And I was like, just just here, I want to fish that one. So I would catch a fish on. Two hundred dollar rod. I had eight hundred dollar rod in my hand. Yep. But here I was fishing the eight hundred, the two hundred dollar rod, just because you know, it, because it had a little bit better fly on it. There wasn't a thimble full of difference in them. Honestly, I mean, you could you could tell the swing weight was a little bit heavier on one versus the other, but the fly delivery was the same. I could lay the fly down. Uh, the guys fishing with could lay the fly down just fine. I guess he'd probably fish four or five times, maybe, over the past three years. So, you know, I don't think it's. It's definitely not the name on the rod. The the rod doesn't make the angler. The angler makes the rod. Uh huh. Totally agree. So we, well, let's 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 circle back around the lines and leaders and weight strategies. Yeah, I want to talk about flies, but I'll, I think we'll do that in the next question. So, is there anything specific on lines that you're doing? Fly lines that you're doing? We're fishing pretty much standard floating lines. You know, it depends on whatever your favorite brand is. You know, I'm fishing pretty much all Rio stuff. You know, generally speaking, 10 years ago, I was overlining everything. You know, it was a pretty common trend in the fly fishing world that if you're yep. fishing a six weight, you're putting a seven weight floating line on there. A lot, a lot of the fly line companies have caught on to that and they're, they have now actually up, uplined their lines. So there's more grains in their lines. Yeah. Now I'm matching them like how it's supposed to be done. Fishing just a lot of indicator lines, a lot of heavy forward, you know, weight forward tips. We're not talking about, you know, swinging in this episode. You know, we're talking about deep water nymphing. So standard floating lines, just generally heavier. You know, if you are, if you are a 10 foot five weight guy, I probably would overline that rod. But yeah, just standard six to eight weight lines. In terms of leaders, you know, most of the time in, for steelhead fishing, you know, we're fishing for larger fish. Um, so we're usually fishing nine foot, one X to three X liters and then slicing tippet to that. You know, for our trout fishing, we don't do a lot of super small bugs out in the West. We don't do a lot of the midging and that kind of stuff. So we rarely tie on five X, you know, so we're fishing a lot of four X liters and three X liters, generally a three X liter with four X tippet spliced onto it. Um, but it depends on what time of year it is too. You know, stone flies are coming out. We're fishing two X when it's egg season and the salmon are laying eggs. You're fishing two X. Uh, so it's all very dependent on the situation. And, but yeah, just nine foot leaders, um, making them adjustable with indicators. Um, there's a favorite indicator out here called the J decator that's kind of taken over the West. Um, it uses a grommet system or a toothpick system, uh, depending on what you like. Uh -huh. And it makes your indicator system really adjustable, you know, so you put four grommets below it and three above and you just kind of get the, the leader, you know, a little slick and you just slide that thing up and down as you want. Tell me what that's called again. It's called a J-decator. It's J-A-Y decator. Oh, okay. And that indicator has pretty much taken over all of California. And it, if you're in a situation where you need to adjust your depth a lot, you know, so generally we want to have our, our deep water nymphing set up, set up about a foot, a foot and a half deeper than the water you're in, you know, so let's say you're in six feet of water. Um, I'd want to set that up for about seven to seven feet. And that Jadicator makes that really easy, easy to do from spot to spot. Yeah, it's pretty standard with lines and leaders. It's just based on what we're fishing for and what size of fly. It's, it's all pretty standard to, I think, all fishing across the board. So let's talk about weight just a minute. So I've been doing some, some high water nymphing, working on weights, uh, weight placement as opposed to fly, you know, sliding the weights together a little bit heavier more compact weight uh spreading them apart a little bit sometimes but for the most part moving them up i used to put my weights fairly close to the fly thinking oh i'll we'll send that fly down send that weight down it'll send that fly down too but i've kind of backed off of that as of late starting i guess starting about this time last year what i did was i 
decided I'm just going to send that weight down. Maybe if I'm fishing eight foot of water, I'll send that weight down about five foot and then let the fly pull itself down a little bit more. And what my thought was is give that fly a little bit more room or an action underneath that weight instead of having them close to where one might drag off the other, spread them out to where maybe I've got a little bit better drag free grip, although you can't see it under there. It's just kind of a, it was a feeling I had, a gut feeling, I guess, and maybe some research, I don't know. But as soon as I started doing that, I started picking up more fish. And so that, that kind of makes me ask kind of ask that question, uh, not just to you, but to other folks of where, if you, are you fishing weight? If you are, where are you putting it on your, on your leader, on your tip? It, where, where is it going? I think when you start talking about deep water nymphing, I think weight strategy is probably your biggest and most important thing you need to know. One thing I think the listeners need to understand a difference between guides and most average fishermen is when we talk leaders, we talk from bobber to the weight, not bobber to your fly. So, and previously when I'm talking about like, you know, say we're fishing six feet of water, we want to have it set up till seven or seven and a half feet. We're not talking about seven to seven and a half feet to your fly. We're talking seven to seven and a half feet from your indicator to your weight. That is very, very critical because a lot of newer or average fly fishermen don't understand that. And so when they talk to someone who is knowledgeable and they're like, oh, how deep are you nipping? I tell someone I'm fishing seven feet and then they go out and put their weight at five feet and then they have their flies two feet below it. And they're like, oh, I'm at seven feet too. Well, the difference in nymphing world, the difference of six inches is it could be from the difference of catching one fish or five fish. <laughs> Leader length is really important, but weight is the most important thing. And we kind of have a funny saying out here in the West, the difference between a good guide and a great guide is one piece of split shot. Yeah. So the way we, tra- the way we traditionally rig up our systems here in the West with indicators is we would have our leader... And on every single leader system, assuming we're doing a traditional indicator system, we're going to have a a blood knot or some kind of splicing knot, the surgeon's knot, whatever you like to tie. And that knot is going to hold your weight for you, right? The only reason for that knot is literally to hold that split shot. And then traditionally what we do is 20 to 24 inches from that weight to your first fly. And then off that first fly, then you can add one more, two more, and in, in most of the West, you're allowed to fish three flies. So it's becoming kind of a trend to fish three flies um, out here. Um, unless you get really dialed in and all your fish are eating one bug, take the third one off, save yourself some money. Right. <laughs> and hassle. And yes. hassle, yes. Yeah. Yes. Angles, you know. Um, yeah. But the system we would run was whatever depth we chose. So let's say we're fishing seven feet of water. We'd have our system set up at like seven and a half feet to our weight. We'd run 20 to 24 inches to our largest fly that we're going to fish. So say we're running a pheasant tail up top. Say our pheasant tail is our point fly. Say it's a 16 or a 14. That would be our top fly under our weight. And then we're going to drop off some other small mayfly, you know, a 16 or 18 off of that, another 20 to 24 inches. We don't do a lot of weight close to our flies. The only times I would do that is if you had, if you didn't have an indicator on at all, mm-hmm. if you're doing more a European style and nymphing, like a Czech style or Euro nymphing, then you're having, you know, you don't have an indicator. So your, your, your weight being closer to your flies is probably better. Yeah. It'll, it'll keep you in touch more with what, what your flies are doing on the bottom. But for a straight indicator system, which we're kind of talking about, um, there is always a splice to hold your weight. <clears throat> And do not be afraid to fish more weight. Um, my, my mentor when I was young told me, if you're waiting and you're not hitting bottom every five to six casts, you're not fishing enough weight. You know, now if you're hitting bottom every other cast, you have too much weight on, right? You need to reduce that, you know. So for us out here, we fish a lot of big, heavy water. Um, so it's really common for us, you know, if we're talking split shot sizes, Triple uh, A is a kind of a common split shot that people use all over the country. Uh, we're going to be fishing two to three triple A's pretty much at all times. Um, if we're talking like super deep water nymphing where we're fishing like flooding flows, which we kind of started the show on, you know, don't be afraid to throw on four triple A's. 
you know, and extend your leader to eight or nine feet, you know, and, and really find that soft water. When flows are ultra high and they're in flood stages, those fish are not worried about feeding. They're literally just wanting to find a place to be safe. So if you're waiting, keep driving the river, you know, keep looking at all the access points until you find some slow water that has, you know, survivable current and there will be a stack of fish there. I promise. <laughs> Insides of bins, oftentimes a, a boat ramp that has a little bit of maybe some rock around it or something to kind of push the water out. Sometimes there's even a Creek coming out of it. A lot of, a, a lot of boat ramps here have a Creek that just seems to be close, but insides of bins is a good place. And sometimes you can get in there and really do some, really have some good days just in a small area. Cause like you said, they do stack up there. As an example, just as flows get ultra high in the flood water, like you talking about like in your springtime, you know, that one year where we had those 30,000 flows, we were doing drifts that were 12 miles long and we were literally fishing five spots in 12 miles. And so, I mean, we're fishing a spot like every two miles, you know, but all of those spots had thousands of fish in them because there was nowhere else for those fish to live. Yeah. You know, so if you're talking just straight deep water and anything with normal flows, just do your thing. But if you're talking like flooding flows, you got to be willing to travel more. You know, you can't just go to your normal spot and expect it to hold fish. Yeah, that's true because your normal spot's probably not going to hold, especially if you're fishing low water. Your normal spot, number one, you're probably not going to be able to get to it. But two, they're probably not going to be there a lot of times. All your best runs that are normal conditions or normal low flows, like they will not be good when the water comes up. Yeah, those fish move somewhere else and generally slower waters where they want to get to. So let's talk about flies just a second. You just mentioned it, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to, cue off of that uh you're talking about a 14 to 16 is a point fly what what other flies are are you in is there weight in are, do you have weight in the flies maybe tungsten beads stuff like that or are you just fishing straight straight non-beaded flies what are y'all doing out there a lot of the rivers we fish here in california aren't ultra technical they're not the san juan they're not the frying pan you know, they're not places that are small and are getting pounded by hundreds of people on a weekly basis. So pretty much all of our flies are beaded. Some are tungsten, some are just standard beads. Like I said earlier, we don't fish a lot of small flies. Uh, we have, just like pretty much anywhere in the West, we have stoneflies, caddis, mayflies, depends on what kind of, what time of year and season it is and the weather pattern. Um, but we're pretty much fishing 14s to 16s year round. Uh, you know, our stone flies are eights and sixes. The sad thing out here is we don't get very much dry fly fishing in California. I mean, so we pretty much are nymphing experts. If we had dry fly fishing, we would be one of the most destination fisheries in the country. Right. Uh, but because we have to watch bobbers and, and nymph deep, we get a lot of local fishing from uh, people in the, the cities. But yeah, flies are all over from Prince Nymphs and, you know, the Prince Nymph has 20 variations, um, <laughs> you know, same with the pheasant tail, right? You know, uh, what we have been finding though, um, and I think pretty much anyone who's in tune to what's happening with the nymph world over the last two years, this whole jigged fish, the whole jig mayfly thing is taking over the nymphing world. Um, right. I'm not a huge fan, but I, I will admit they, they work really well. I tend to stick to some of more of the traditional old school patterns. We have, I mean, every river has their local patterns, you know. Um, but what I was going to say is that from those jig flies is we're finding that our, our thinner profile mayflies are working better than our traditional pheasant tails. You know, um, not to say pheasant tails still don't work, but, um, you know, flies that have less material, smaller bodies, um, not smaller hooks, just smaller bodies. Right. Tend to, they seem to be doing better than your traditional hare's ear or your pheasant tail or your prince nymph, you know. Um, so the fish are getting smarter, you know, and I, I think fly tires are getting smarter with them. And I think that's why you're starting to see a lot of this jigged fly take over the, over the, the nymph world is that it's really a smaller profile fly that has a bunch of weight attached. Yeah, and I think that part of that is is, is oh, so we were we were fishing. I don't know, it's been a month or two ago. Super clear, gin clear, real gin clear water, uh, and we were nymphing in it. 
and we had on a jig fly, which I just got through tying some. It's the first time I've tied flies, and I don't know when, but I just got through tying some jig flies over behind me uh, just to, before I went to eat. And we were fishing gin clear water, jig fly, jig hooks, and bouncing them through rocks. Now, just under an indicator, still fishing under an indicator and all that. But you, you could actually see what the fly was doing, I guess is my point. And it would like the fly would come up to a rock, it would hit the rock, and then it might just cr not crawl over a rock, but it really looked like it crawled over a rock and then dropped on the other side. You know, the indicator would pull it a little bit. And I think any other traditional fly nymph that I had that I have in my box would have been hung up behind that rock. I don't think it would have come up over it. It was a sixty degree hook, you know, bend in the in the shank and all that. So. I, I think a, a normal quote unquote normal hook would have would have stuck on the rock. This one, I actually saw the fly bounce over it, slide across it, and drop off the other side several times, not just once, several times. So I think you spend a lot less time being hung up, false false setting the hook because you think it might be a fish. Uh, it just kind of like slides, and it's really kind of a little more free uh, with the jig hooks. There, there is no doubt that they are catching thousands of fish across this country. And, you know, that's why you're seeing more and more jig patterns popping up every year. Yeah. Whatever manufacturer you're buying them from. I'm not a huge fan in terms of how they look. Yeah, they don't look, they don't look sexy, do they? <laughs> they do not, you know, um, the whole saying of some flies are sold to fishermen and some flies catch fish. Yeah. Um, they look one of like one of those flies that would be sold to a fisherman, but I don't know. They work really well. I, I think you're going to see more and more flies over the next four to five years all go to that jigged hook style. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that this slim profile with a bead is really getting down in their face quick. Uh, there's, it's not taking hardly any time for them to fall to, uh, you know, to wherever they're, wherever they're headed to, they're there pretty quick, which gives you more presentation time which is, you know, that's, that's the name of the game is good presentation and lots of it. Uh, so let's talk about, let's move on to presentation in just a minute. So yeah, I, I like the fact that y'all are fishing. It's interesting to get the point of point of view from somewhere, you know, across the country on the other side of the country from us. What, what is your point of view on, on presentation or how, how are you having folks present their fly how are they mending? How are they doing all that stuff whenever uh, whenever you're on high water? Yeah, I, I think if you're talking about true high water fishing, I'm not sure how important presentation is. You know, I, I think when you're fishing true high water, if you're talking like, you know, early flood stages, I think it's more about finding the spot where the fish is mm -hmm. um, than it is about having the perfect presentation. Now, if you're talking about low clear conditions, where the fish has a lot of time to see your fly, then I think presentation is crucial. Yeah. Um, so deep water nymphing in, in clear water, I think is important presentation. Uh, deep water nymphing in, you know, let's say high water, or higher flows and normal presentation isn't as important. But like we all talk about, the dead drift is, is the number one thing. You know, how can you get your fly to sit as still as possible, as long as possible? You know, so if you're waiting, you know, that means, you know, casting up at a 45 degree, degree angle and letting it flow past you and, and really to go on to the next level in terms of skill is learning how to extend your drift below you, you know, by doing stack mins, you know, keep throwing those mins behind it and, you know, adding your line at a proper time, not adding too much slack where if the bobber goes down and you're, you know, you're behind the hook set. Oh, yeah, nice. but not being not being not being behind adding line where your bag your you know your indicator is dragging the whole way through the drift. There there's a lot of skill in that dead drift if you're waiting and learning how to add slack at the right amount of time with the right amount of slack as it's floating below you and getting a drift that is you know being extended by you know let's say 25 30 or even 40 feet in some conditions if if you have to that's the difference between an average angler and a good angler. Um, someone who can keep their indicator drifting free the longest possible is just going to get more more chances and your fly is going to look more realistic. 
assuming that person's fishing enough weight and his leader's long enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of variables to this. But if you're really fishing, let's say, spring conditions for you guys where you have high water, uh, yes, some of that dead drifting is important, but it's half as important as when the water is low. You know, th those fish are not looking to eat. They're looking to survive. And they are so hungry from off-color water or not being in a, a line that's comfortable to feed that they'll eat something that's not perfectly presented to them just because they're hungry. Presentation on clear cold water or clear high flows uh, is important. Presentation on high water and dirty water, not as important. But it's really learning... I always say finding the fish and knowing you're fishing over fish is more important than how perfect your presentation is. It, we, you were talking a while ago about enough slack versus too much slack, you know, or too much slack versus not enough slack. And I'll find folks that are uh, maybe newer to nymphing and you say, Hey, I want you to, to roll out some line for me. And, you know, they roll out a little bit. It moves the bobber. It stops it. You know, it's, it's, and then they, you know, like, okay, we'll put out some more. And then they put out a little more. And then the bobber stops and pulls. And, you know, the, the fly is just coming up, like it's swinging up every time that they they roll some line into it because they don't have enough slack to start with. Too much slack is, is a whole different problem. But don't be afraid to roll slack into it because that's that's – just about as important as anything else. Well, yeah, by rolling that slack into your drift, that's how you're going to extend your drift. You know, that's how you're going to get your flies to go from a 10 foot drift to a 25 foot drift is by keep adding and rolling that slack out behind it, you know, yep. allowing, allowing that indicator to float free in the current. But if you're only adding a foot or two at a time, it's not enough slack. And so your bobber is slowly getting dragged and pulled by your fly line that you're as soon as that bobber has any drag on it, your flies are coming off the bottom. Right. Yep. If you're getting, if you're not adding enough slack to your presentation, and so you're only adding a foot or two at a time, then all of a sudden your bobber goes freely for a foot or two, and then it pauses, and then you're trying to add another foot or two. When that thing pauses, your flies just rose up two feet. Right. Do you add the foot or two, then your flies drop back down. So what's happening as you go through the drift is your flies are literally jigging up and down because you're not adding enough slack to allow your flies to float freely the entire way. That's exactly what I exactly what I was saying. Also, I think you put it a little bit better than I did. And, and that that pause where the flies start raising is is killer. I mean, you're you're, you're no you're no longer once you do that, you're no longer really dead drifting for. A, for a certain amount of time to get it under control. Right. And I think that that part is part of that is people are afraid that, well, if I have too much slack out there, I'm not going to be able to set the hook, which is true, but you know, you're going to be able to set the hook a whole lot better than what you think you are. You just can't have 30 feet of slack in a 10 foot drift. You're going to have to have some control over it. Yeah. When, when I teach a lot of people, like when we're doing walking away trips and, you know, they're learning to extend drifts below them. You know, I teach people to like try to add four to five feet of slack at a time. Yeah. You know, four or five feet is an appropriate amount that your bobber is going to float freely. It's going to give you a handful of seconds to kind of just gather yourself, watch the bobber float, and then add another four to five feet. You know, doing the one to two feet, it's, it's too quick in between the intervals. You can't ever get your bobber to float completely free on the dead drift. But if you're throwing out an eight to 10 foot loop out there, then all of a sudden if the bobber dives down, you have too much slack and you can't set the hook, you know? Yeah. So it, it's a real balance in learning how to do a true dead drift when you're waiting. Yeah. Now, when you're in a boat and you're just floating along, it's a whole different conversation, you know, just, you don't need that much slack because the boat is floating with you and the boat is doing the dread drift for you. Yeah. That's kind of an easy way to do it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you catch a lot more fish that way. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I so I was telling, I was saying earlier, I saw your book on Instagram and just kind of on a whim ordered it, and and uh, that that you're a new new author author, but you really did hit a home on this one. Uh, so as I, I I read the first chapter, and I remember telling you this, hey, I read the first chapter and decided I'd contact you and 
see if we couldn't get together. And, and it's evolved to something that I think is a real good topic. But what in the world inspired you to write a book? Yeah, I um, like we've mentioned, I've been blessed to guide for 20 years. And when when you've guided thousands of days, you've had all kinds of interesting experiences <laughs> happen to you. Um, just part of being a guide. I was actually on a hosted trip in Wyoming, and we had six guys out there fishing the South Fork of the Snake River uh, and then the Green River. And um, we were all sitting around the table drinking wine one night, and my father was part of the group. And my dad said, hey, why don't you tell us one of your one of your funnier guide stories? And so I just rattled off a story, you know, and everyone's laughing, making comments. And, and then that turned into a second story and then, you know, a third story. And, you know, eventually it goes on for like several hours, you know, and everyone goes to bed. We wake up with a slight hangover and um, my dad and I are drinking coffee the next morning. He goes, man, last night was a blast. Like that was so much fun. And he goes, did you realize like you literally had the whole table rolling for like two and a half hours. Um, he goes, there's something there. Like you need to either write that down for yourself or for our family, you know, so that when you're older, you can look back and you can remember all this. And I kind of kept that in the back of my head for a long time. And um, one day I had some free time. And so I just decided to open my laptop and started typing. And what I found is uh, I really enjoyed reliving the memories I really enjoyed um, mentally going to that space. And so God has really blessed me with a really vivid memory, you know, so I can go, if there's something memorable that happens, I can like mentally go into that space and I can feel it. I can see it. You know, I remember it. And I just started writing, but when you're on a guide trip, you can't really give your own perspective all the time, right? Like you have to be, you have to be courteous to your clients, right? Yep. Yes. And <laughs> when you're writing a book and you're not using real names, um, you can kind of be a little edgy and, you know, give a different perspective. You know, we always hear the perspective when we read books from the angler, right? Like there's sure. all kinds of fly fishing books written from the angler's point of view. There's very few books that are written from a guide's point of view. And when you get to come into the book, you, you, you really are coming into 20 years. And I'm just telling you a couple of the highlights. And I'm, my hope is that, you know, a reader feels invited and they can feel that space like we felt it that day. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and then as a reader, you get to hear my perspective, which may make you laugh or, you know whatever it does for you. Um, so yeah, my dad really inspired me, but I just, I had so much fun doing it. Um, it was really enjoyable. Like I'm already working on my second book actually. No. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, I, I feel really honored. Um, it's, it's one thing to get praise from your family and your friends, but when someone like David reads the book and says, wow, you hit a Homer, like, I mean that warms my soul. <laughs> yeah, it's it it's good. I have to say it is good. It's, uh, uh, the one that's sticking out. And I'm not all the way through it yet. I'm probably just past halfway now. Uh, but the one that sticks out for me is the the brown trout in the net. Uh, that one. <laughs> if you don't if you don't laugh at that chapter, <laughs> I have to question your humor. <laughs> yeah, something's up with you. Something up. Something is bad. Uh, bad wrong with you if you don't laugh about that one. Um, so give us, give us a 411 on cast hope, because we talked about that the other day. I want to hear a little more about it. Yeah. So cast hope is a nonprofit organization. Um, I founded 12 years ago. Um, my wife and I attend a Presbyterian church in Chico, uh, when we used to live there and our pastor was talking about using your personal gifts to change your local community. So I went in that Sunday morning and heard the sermon. And most Sundays you walk out and you forget everything. And <laughs> that, that Sunday I couldn't get it out of my head. So I really, um, for weeks afterwards, I kept like kind of chewing on it and evaluating what I was doing for my own community. And um, God's given me a gift for guiding. I'm really good at it. Uh, I had all the equipment. I have the boats. 
And so I decided uh, one trip a month, I was going to donate a trip and bless some kid having a hard time. So at first it was just kind of word, word of mouth. You know, I had a kid who his parents were going through divorce. There was a separation in the family, right? So I took the kid and his dad fishing. The second month I took a kid who was going through chemo, right? Having a, a health battle. Um, this went on for about six months and eventually had this junior high kid come out in the boat with his uncle and the junior high kid had lost his father the year before. So his uncle was stepping into his life, trying to be that male role model. So we were on the Sacramento river. We were deep water nymphing and, uh, the junior high kid, uh, hooked and land his second fish and he was in the front of the boat and his uncle was behind me. So we're taking pictures, we let the fish go, and the kid just shows this pure joy, <laughs> tells his uncle, he goes, this is the coolest thing I've ever done. I want to go buy a fly rod. I want this to become our thing. Like, I want, I want to do this again with you. And I was sitting in the middle, and some people call it a God moment. Some people call it a holy shit moment, whatever you believe. And I was like, I have to figure out how to do this more than once a month. And so... I was currently working on an MBA part-time and guiding full-time. And so I worked with some of my professors to create a business plan. And we, uh, we started Cast Hope. Um, the first year we had a goal of serving 50 kids, you know, just in the Northern California area. And then year by year, we've been blessed and our budget has grown. We've been able to serve more kids. Um, and then five years into the program, we had a donor come to us and said, hey, what does it take to get Cast Hope into the Tahoe, Reno area? And I said, well, I got the business model. I just need money. You know, and so that donor uh, gave $30,000 to start a second region of Cast Hope. Wow. And so um, that was seven years ago. And uh, we started our second region of Cast Hope called Cast Hope Tahoe. And every year we've been fortunate enough that we've been growing slowly. We're, um, we haven't grown fast, but we now have uh, four regions of Cast Hope. We have three in California. We have Northern California, Tahoe, and we have one in San Diego. And then I'm happy to say, uh, getting closer to your guys in the neck of the woods, we just started Cast Hope in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, nice. So that's our first expansion um, out of California. And then our hope is to start Castle up here in Montana, probably in a year or two. Um, so the whole goal of Castle Hope is really using fly fishing as a vehicle to bless underprivileged kids. You know, kids that are having a hard time in life. It, it could be anything, right? Like you could use rock climbing. You could use golf. You know, we have a group of people who are really passionate and who are really good at fly fishing. So what we have done is Casop has brought on a bunch of guides who work under the Casop name and we offer guided trips. And then once a kid goes on that guided trip, if that child says, wow, that was really fun. I had a blast. I want to do that again. The second trip they go on, we provide them with free rods, reels, flies. Oh, nice. Really nice. Then we take them to a spot where they can fish on their own, where they don't need a boat. Right. We, we use the boats to catch them. Like, this is how we do it. This is, we're having a good time. And then on the second trip, they go out, they go on a local creek or a smallmouth pond or catching bluegill, whatever it may be. And we give them a fly rod flies and we teach them how to fish that local spot so they can become independent outside of Cast Hope. Our hope is that once a kid comes into Cast Hope, we, you know, that we will have that kid until he graduates high school. So we serve kids from the age of 10 to 18. Sometimes they come in at 10 and they leave when they graduate when they're 18. Others come in when they're 15 and stay through the end. What I never expected when I started this 12 years ago is that we would have cast of kids who are really passionate about fly fishing, who have now become fly fishing guides. Really? So we have, <laughs> we have three cast of kids who uh, have become guides. We have, uh, we have one on the Madison River in Montana. We have one on the South Fork in Idaho. And we have one in Northern California doing the Sacramento River. No kidding. Huh. That is not that is not the goal of Cast Hope, but um, it's kind of the fruit of, you know, connecting with some of these kids and, and helping them grow their passion into a career. That's fantastic. So, yeah. So we currently are serving 700 kids a year. 
through the organization. And we're giving away about 200 fly rods a year to kids now. And everything is free for them. The only thing they have to provide is a fishing license. And all the guides are free, food's free, you know, and they just have to show up. So um, I feel really humbled to be the one that started it. There has been lots of people who have breathed life into it. Um, but we are growing and we hope to continue to grow past soap to other parts of the country. And, uh, our hope is in probably in the next 10 years that we have 10 or 12 locations across the country and we're serving, serving a lot of kids. 700 is nothing to shake a stick at. That's for sure. That's, that's awesome. Yep. 700 kids a year. And our, our goal this year is 750. So good for you. So if, if somebody wanted to start a chapter, extend the organization, would they just get in contact with you? Yeah, you, you can reach out to me on castle.org. All my contact information is there. Um, starting about talking, starting chapters, the different conversation, um, you know, that has to be approved by our board of directors. And there's got to be a lot of vision behind that. Um, we, we are really thoughtful when we grow to a spot. You know, we usually take a year and a half or so to to do our homework and um we first we got to care for the kids and we just got to make sure the people behind it are um going to protect the kids and also just have a passion for serving youth so yes if someone's interested in that or someone's interested in donating um they can do that on the cast hope website but yeah all the information you need is on the website okay all right, and I'll put that out there on the show notes as well so that folks can take a look at that i think that's uh i i cruised it uh before we I guess a couple of weeks ago when we were talking the last time I went out and, and took a look at it and good stuff right there doing good things. It sounds like uh, interesting. It was all off of a, a sermon that just kind of touches you and, and sets the wheels in motion to do, do good things. That's good. That's a good thing. We, we need more of that in the world. That's for sure. Well, let's get back to deep water nymphing then we have talked about gosh we've talked about several things here what all we talked about we talked about the type of water what do you do whenever all the flows kind of the the whole river looks the same and then we talked about uh your your setup for deep water nymphs your rods your rods your lines your weights your leaders uh weight strategies uh we talked about flies a little bit we talked about your book and talked about cast hope, but on the on the deep water nymphing front, what is the one thing that we haven't asked about deep water nymphing that we should have asked that would really help the listener? My thing is be aggressive. I think as fishermen, we tend to be timid. There are situations, you know, let's say let's take trout fishing for example. Like there are situations where you need to be quiet and stealthy, and you got to use small flies. But I think most of the time we overthink how, you know, sensitive trout to are. And when you start talking deep water nymphing, if you're talking fish that are five to 10 feet away from you, you literally could be blaring music and it won't matter, you know, how many fish you catch. You know, um, I have a client who literally comes with a wireless speaker and plays Pandora in the boat all day long. <laughs> and like he catches just as many fish as a guy who doesn't talk and wears, you know, mute colored clothes. So when I say be aggressive, you know, like don't, don't be shy. Like it's okay to wait aggressively. It's okay to set the hook hard. You know, if you're using three X and four X, if you're deep water nymphing and your flies are seven, eight feet away from you, you need to set the hook hard. Generally when we're teaching our clients how to fish, 90% of the time we're telling them to set the hook harder. You know, I mean, I, I literally probably have five clients a year. I'm saying, okay, you're setting the hook too hard. You know, so, yeah. you know, if, if you're fishing a dry fly, obviously don't do that, right? Like you're fishing a dry fly, there is no slack in your system or there's minimal slack in your system. So you don't set the hook hard because you're going to break your fly off. But if you're fishing a fly that's seven, eight feet away from you, you have to set the hook hard to make sure you penetrate that hook in the fish's jaw. And then after you set the hook, be aggressive on your strip. Your first two or three strips need to be really aggressive to get that tension on the fish and prevent that fish from rolling over and dumping your fly. You know, so often someone will set the hook really hard and they strip one time and they stop stripping until they have full tension on the rod. Mm -hmm. There comes a point when you hook that fish that after that second strip or that third strip, then all of a sudden you'll have to decide, do I keep stripping or now do I let my line go in the fish run? But our line slip and I'll let go, but um, let the line slip, let the fish run. But in all of that, what we're talking about is being more aggressive. 
you know, being more aggressive on your hook set, being more aggressive on your initial strips, you know, don't be afraid to like yell at your friend or you're not going to scare the fish. Like it, it, you know, if you're talking about fish that are feeding in a foot of water and they're eating size 20 trichos, then yeah, you need to be quiet and a little stealthy. Yeah. It's a different story, a whole different picture. Right. And, but if you're fishing in five to 10 feet of water, like, don't worry about if you're kicking over a rock on the bank. Like, it's not it's not going to affect the fish from eating your fly, you know? And a lot of times, you can get away with heavier tippet than you think you can. You know, if you're fishing a size 6 fly, like, be aggressive and fish 2x. Don't, don't, don't fish a size 6 fly on 4x. You know, always give yourself the upper advantage. And in all of that, it kind of has the same thing. Just be more aggressive. Here, it's 6x is kind of the... You hear more about six x than do anything, and you know if the water's if the water's like you said if it's super clear, uh, he eating trichos all that stuff you know okay maybe six x then, but five x four x some for us sometimes three x, uh, I'm not afraid to fish any of that really, uh, on on higher water on murky water. You know, when the lake's turning over and it's got that green color in it, I'm not afraid to go up a little bit uh, to a little bit thicker diameter, tip it or leader or any of that. I'm just, I'm just not afraid to because I don't think they're looking for it anyway. So I totally agree with that, especially on higher water. If you're fishing 6X, six six X, totally avoid everything I just said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and if you're fishing 6X six X, six X on high water, you may be in the wrong ballpark. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, this is just a story and it, it may be a tangent, but, um, one of my best friends, his name's Todd Kinsilla and he's probably the best freshwater guide I've ever met in my life. And Todd and I had this huge debate, uh, during the fall, the fall we have egg bite, our salmon show up, they start spawning. It's just like, a, it's like a mini Alaska, right? Uh-huh. So we're, fishing, we're, fishing, we're fishing eggs behind salmon, spawning salmon. And for years, we had this debate. Uh, Todd would say, oh, man, when it's clear and sunny, you know, I only fish 3X. And I was like, it doesn't matter. You know, like you could fish 2X or 1X, you know. And he's like, well, it, it makes a difference. We hook more fish this way. I was like, Todd, <laughs> I have fished behind you hundreds of days, and I'm catching just as many fish on you, and I'm not breaking any fish off. And you're breaking off three or four rigs a day because you're throwing 3X with your egg patterns. And so for years, we had this debate back and forth. And then we, we've done multiple group trips together. And like, it was kind of this running joke, right? And one day, I finally just challenged him. And, and Todd is ultra competitive. And I said, okay, here's the deal. Fish your front rod in your boat on 3X all day. Fish your back rod on 2X all day. See if there's any noticeable difference. And also see how many eggs you break off by the end of the trip. And so... He calls me on the way home and he goes, yeah, Ryan, you're completely right. The guy yeah. in the back of the boat caught just as many fish and he never lost an egg all day long. And I lost three eggs in my front rod. <laughs> so I think there are, situa- there are situations where 6X is necessary. I'll be honest. I don't even own a spool of 6X. <laughs> <laughs> nice to be in the West, I guess. <laughs> yes. Um, but I rarely tie five on. Um, a lot of people fish five out here. It's just, in my opinion, if you're not fishing a size 18 fly, you don't really need five X. If you're fishing a size, if you're fishing a size 16, four X four carbon will catch just as many fish as the guy who's fishing five X. And you're giving yourself an advantage by being able to land more and break less off. That, those thinner tippets, you sure can lose some fish that way, that and, and have some heartbreak moments in the in the process too when you're breaking something like that that off. Are y'all pinning eggs or are you fishing straight off the of hooks or what are y'all doing? Yeah, we 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 do both. It depends on the situation, but most of the time we're pegging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to peg. You know, some people wrap their leaders through it. It's not the most it's not the best way to do it because you're creating a weak spot in your line. Yeah. Um, some people do two fix. Um, kind of the, the best method out here is we're actually taking weed whacking material. Um, go to your local Home Depot. Yeah. Buy some clear weed whacker and just cut an angle at it and shove it up in the bead and um, cut it off. Oh, that's a good idea. 
Not thought of that, huh? Yeah, you have to you have to get the right size. Um, so they they depends on what type you buy. Um, but point zero eight five from Black and Decker is like the perfect bead size if if you're ordering from trout beads, which a lot of people do. Oh yeah, that's where I've got some of those. So yeah, that works out perfect. Yeah. Huh. Well, I learned something good there. Save me some, yeah. save me some coins. Yeah, the weed, weed, weed whacker thing is money. You just cut it at an angle, shove it up there, cut it off, and six oh. great. Huh, okay. I have to do that. Well, what do you say we wrap this thing up? We've been going about a little over an hour. Yes, sir. If you find value in the podcast, drop by the Southeastern Fly Store and explore the merch that fuels this podcast. So who was our guest today? Ryan is the, the founder of Cast Hope. Positively impacts kids from California all the way to North Carolina through guide mentor relationships and God relationships. I guess that's where it really started. Uh, you can find out more about Cast Hope at www.casthope.org. Uh, our guest wrote a book, A Real Job, which is a, which is a uh, book of short stories and thoughts from the river. I highly recommend it. I'd, it's just, it's good. That's about all I can say about it. Uh, he's guided and host trips, uh, guided for 20 years and hosted trips for throughout the West. Ryan, really appreciate you stopping by for this episode. It's been a good, it's been a good conversation. Thank you, David. Hope you guys learned a few things and uh, it's a privilege to be on here. You just listened to Ryan Johnston on Southeastern Fly. See you next time. <laughs>